hosting me. I've had a great week in Singapore. I'm now adjusted to the time. Tomorrow I go back to Chicago. So, <laughs> but I, I, I feel so welcomed here. Um, people are so nice. The food is so amazingly good. Yes, it's been great. Um, a little background on me. I have been teaching at Northwestern University in um, Chicago for about 18 years. Um, and I got my PhD there, and I studied with Peter Webster, who studies creative thinking in music, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But before that, I was a high school band director in, in the States. So I was trained uh, at Indiana University. My goal is, when I was in fifth grade, when I was 10 years old, I wanted to be a band director. And I, uh, my first job was teaching young children how to play instruments, and I conducted the band. And, but the longer I taught, the more I became frustrated about the fact that the students I was teaching did not get to make any creative decisions. I was making all the decisions for them. And it kind of led me to my degree in, uh, my master's degree in educational psychology and creative thinking, and then eventually my PhD. And since I got my um, doctorate, I've been working with children of all ages. Um, trying to figure out more, learn more about their creative thinking processes, what is the best way to get them to compose, to improvise, because, I don't know about here, but in the States, our music curriculum is very Western, European-centric performance-based, you know, getting students to perform, and, and that was my frustration, not think out of the box, not think creatively, not thinking about creating music from their own soul. What I've learned in my many years of uh, working with children is that composition and improvisation are incredibly, incredibly powerful for them. Um, they, they love it, they can do it, and um, in the last few years it's taken me to work with uh, adolescents who are in jail, in detention centers, uh, 14 to 18 year olds, Getting them to compose using uh, like their hip hop style and finding again that it's incredibly, incredibly powerful. It gives them the sense of agency, the sense of well-being, if you will. So that's where it's taken me, and I'm still, still haven't found any answers, actually, but uh, still consider, consider it. What I'm going to present today is a little background on creativity in general the creativity research literature from a Western perspective. Um, shout out to Professor Leonard Tan, who speaks philosophically about creativity from an Eastern perspective. Very different, right? Um, so I want to say that, that this is a, the, the, the research from a Western perspective. And we'll have some discussion. And then I want to move on to thoughts about assessment. So how do you assess children's creativity through their compositions and improvisation? And then I would love to, um, maybe we'll take a little break, move around a bit, and then play some music for you, some children's compositions, and see as future teachers, how would you respond to that child if that's what they composed? Because that's the tricky bit, not, not squelching their souls when you hear their compositions. All right, that's the plan. <coughs> oh boy, I had trouble with this the other day. Backwards. <coughs> Just throw out some words. <coughs> something, something new. Improvise. Novelty. Novelty. Freedom. Freedom. Fusion. Fusion. Say more about that. Um, adopting the ah, ideas from different things. And then integrating, maybe coming up with mm. something that is unique. Right. Own. So combining things. Fusion. Nice. Miss anything? <laughs> breaking rules. Sometimes to create something new, we have to break rules. Right? <coughs> if you 
seen, uh, how, how, how would I say this, have you um, come across children who are seem very creative? You might say, oh, that child is really creative. You don't think about it really, but you say, this child is so creative. Why? What does that child do to make you say that? The experiment. The experiment. They talk out of turn. They're breaking the rules. <coughs> you tell them to do one thing, and they do something different. Have you seen, can you imagine in a, in a place where you're teaching where some children stick out like that? The, 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 the creative type, perhaps? You say, do this, and whatever they come up with is completely different. They break the rules, right? So when we put those words together, breaking rules, uh, experimenting, doing something I said not to do, uh, that how do we how do we control that in a classroom? How would we if we wanted that if we valued that how would we teach children to be creative as teachers? I think you need to be open to ideas when you're teaching, and you cannot just be following something very sequential. <coughs> right? Easy? So, letting go of control, perhaps? Yeah. You know, having a, a plan with more than one possible answer, or a space that you don't know what the children are going to do? Very risky, isn't it? Letting go? Open to ideas? <laughs> Oh my gosh. <clears throat> I have to click in the right place. Can we talked about that. Any other questions we should be asking or considering when we talk about teaching creativity in, in, in our classrooms? When I and I'm going to go through the, like I said, just a little bit of background about creativity, creative thinking in general, and then we'll take it to the music classroom. If something strikes you, please, uh, there will be time again for you to ask questions or something that might not make sense to you. Please, I encourage you to. You can even interrupt me. So one way um, the research literature has organizer way of thinking about creativity is to put it in these what we call four P's, person, process, product, and place. And that's a really easy way to kind of untangle what we need, what we know, perhaps, based on research, creativity. And I want to go through each of these, and, and nothing will surprise you. We've already described some of the things that we found in, in research about what it needs to be created. We'll start with people. And this comes from uh, a compilation, many, many uh, research studies that uh, have come up with these kind of descriptors of what creative people do. And you've, you've mentioned some of these. seen these children in our classrooms but you know just something else, something I want to um, caution against is that uh, the creative person the creative child isn't all isn't always the troublemaker or the person running around that we can't control it could be a very very quiet child who is um, the brain is doing this but is as a Behaviorally, is very, very just quiet and afraid to perhaps speak his or her independence or, or risk taking. So it's not that they're the, the crazy children. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but uh, these are these are uh, characteristics of creative people. Now I highlighted the last four on the right. Uh, what we often associate 
with measuring creativity in research literature is fluency, flexibility, originality, and elaboration. There are the most famous research test for testing somebody's creativity is the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking. It's a standardized test. Again, it's a, it's a Western view. And uh, it tests, it measures a person's fluency, the ability to create many answers, their flexibility. The answers are uh, different, and I'll show you an example. The originality, we've heard originality, and their ability to uh, elaborate and add detail. This goes back to uh, J.P. Guilford in 1950. He uh, proposed a structure of intellect model. And in, I think it was a 1950 or maybe a 1954 address to the American Psychological uh, Association. <coughs> this, this, this model uh, is not creating people. It's his way he, he envisioned people think uh, very much pre- multiple intelligences, actually, like the gardener. But um, he proposed one of the operations in our structure of intellect was divergent thinking, as opposed to convergent thinking, where we come to the right answer. And uh, he's, he's like the first one in 1950 who came up with these ideas of fluency, flexibility, originality, and collaboration. And he did this through many, 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 many kinds of testing, uh, tests that he tried. It was, um, really, really influenced how we in the West think about testing, measuring for creative thinking. So you're going to see, and I want to talk about, we, we're moving on from people to process, and I want to talk about uh, the process, and you're going to see Guilford's influence, really strong influence, since 1950. One of the very often cited is that, uh, in the creative process, and this is from Graham Wallace in 1926, and it was more of a philosophical paper than anything, but it really stuck. This idea of when you're creative, you go through four stages in the process, so leaving people to process. It takes time to prepare, time away, you may be working on something, and then it, it requires you to leave it for a while, and your brain kind of incubates, and it misses, mix, mixes up with the recipe. There's a moment of aha, called the illumination moment, and then you verify and create the product if you will. Very often cited, the Wallace stages. But to me, it's a curiosity because, um, like I said, he wrote this back in 1926, almost more of a philosophical stance, but it's been cited ever since, and I'm not sure, and maybe the researchers in here can tell me, I'm not sure it's really been tested empirically. But I'm not sure. There may be research that is tested. It's one of the things we just kind of we go with. And then the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking. It is a standardized, most widely used test of creative thinking. It comes right from <coughs> Guilford. So here's an example of what we might ask a child to do. And this is for testing, not grading, not measuring, not, not assessing uh, in school, but how we might test somebody's creative thinking. It gives sense, uh, sense to read that. This is one of the tests, there, there are several, but they all have to do with this idea of giving a kernel of something to do and asking the child to go at it. And you measure the child's response, taking the little squiggles, you give them to a judge, and the judge or a rater will measure them on fluency, flexibility, originality, and elaboration. So fluency might be how many times the child took that first squiggle and tried to create things. So fluency is just pure quantity. Flexibility, how different is it? You know, did the child just take that first 
thing in the upper left hand corner and make it a letter and just made it a letter and just made it a letter but elaborated on the letter or did he take the letter and suddenly turn it into mountains and then suddenly turn it into mm, food see that's flexibility how original is it they test the they measure the originality compared to other respondents and then how elaborate you know how many little elaborations did you have add to it's proven very uh, a very uh, hard reliable test meaning that judges agree um, and has been used over and over and over and over and over again so it's a very hardy test I'm, I'm lacking for the uh, testing word help the validity um, yeah, all of those, right. <laughs> it just stood the test of time. One could question the construct validity, but we'll, I'm going to take you there. Uh, any questions about that? Do you get a sense of the Torrance test and how it comes from Guilford and his uh, thoughts about the structure of intellect? And then Peter Webster took this test and tried to create, did create, a measure of creative thinking in music following the Torrance test. So in his test, he gives children um, 10 tasks that get progressively more um, elaborate, if you will. Children are seated, seated at a, um, a piano, a keyboard, with a Nerf ball, and the reason for giving them a Nerf ball is so if a child has had years of piano training, that's not going to give them an advantage. You have wood blocks and a microphone, and um, each task asks the child to make something up, and it gets progressively more elaborate, as I said. And I'll show you one of the tasks as an example. But you see what he's scoring on. Recognize that across the top? extensiveness. He uses the term extensiveness, the same idea of flexibility. In this test we measure for creativity uh, extensiveness by just how long is the composition. How long is the task. More is better. Going back to Guilford, fluency, etc. Flexibility, originality, and then he, his final one is not elaboration but syntax. How well does it hold together as a musical piece? And come up with the score. Here is an example of task seven. Frog music. It's time to make some more frog music. I would like you to make up a piece of music that has jumpy sounds and smooth sounds, soft and loud sounds, and fast and slow. Feel free to use all the keys on the piano. If the child has a Nerf ball, do you know what a Nerf ball is? Yeah. A round, spongy ball. Um, and to make your piece as long as you want. Now think about your frog music for a while, and when you're ready, I would like to hear it. The child thinks and then they take their sponge ball and makes a song on the piano, rock music. And here's the way the score is, it's hard to read. Um, extensiveness, record the clock time in seconds. Flexibility, soft, loud, fast, low, high, slow. Did they do that? Was there a gradual change? If they didn't do any of that, there would be low flexibility score. Originality, unusual aspects, unusual meters, dynamic contrast, uh, large and small intervals, complexity, <coughs> and then syntactical, uh, musical phrasing, complementary rhythmic or melodic motion, etc. Right? Any questions about this? Get the idea of how Guilford to Torrance to Webster, measuring creative thinking. <coughs> And the last task is free composition, and there's a picture of a, a series of um, rocket ships, ideas of Martian is going off into space, so pretty abstract, it's like compose whatever you like. And same kind of scoring system. So in essence, the Torrance test and the Webster test is, is kind of scoring a creative process creative person would have a creative process. And you 
can see the direct links there. Teresa Mobley, uh, who I'm going to talk about a lot because she has a very different view of creativity and we're going to play with her idea, um, talks about the process as cognitive and personality processes conducive to novel thinking. These include, you've seen all these. Her name is going to come back, and I'll, I'll talk about how she tests for creative thinking or creativity. And then place. The place is really important, the, the environment, the classroom. And you've, you've hinted on that a little bit, how to set up a place that's conducive to creative thinking. Makes sense, doesn't it? Makes a lot of sense. This is the t part that's difficult con to control as a teacher, I think. To have a place where children can, can, can get messy and have fun. Time pressure. I only see my students once a week for 40 minutes and we have to give them a grade in 10 weeks. Ah, I can't let them be creative. So we've gone people, process, place, a creative product. If you would hold all of, most all of the literature together, Western literature on creative products, it seems that we've come to a pretty agreeable definition that something is creative, and this came out a little bit when I was asking you questions at the beginning, something is creative if it's novel, but also appropriate. Not just novel. This is novel. It's never been done before. Novel. The, the appropriate, the syntax that holds together. Uh, right? You can argue with me, but don't argue with me because I'm just reporting the literature. <laughs> I mean, this, this is kind of what we've agreed on. Uh, you know, when judge, judging a product, it's novel and it's yet appropriate. So a child's composition is novel to, to her. That, that's the other thing, is the second grader novelty uh, shouldn't be judged against Mozart's novelty, although that's debated in the literature as well. Some say, you know, there's creativity means you change the domain. Big C creativity. But I, as teachers, we believe in little c creativity, where a second grader can be creative as well. There would be some who would argue with that. So novel and appropriate, and we can say novel and syntactical, or, right? Amobly simplifies everything, and that's why I like simple, simple, simple. This is her definition, oh, my mouse is over here. I'm going to create a product. Oh, oops, wrong side. I'm, I'm getting it. Forget fluency, flexibility, originality, elaboration, blah, 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 blah. A creative product is creative if judges, expert judges, rate it as creative. Period. So simple, so elegant. And she calls, the, the, the way she has tested this through the years is the consensual assessment technique. If, uh, she's done this mostly in visual art, design, architecture. Give a panel of judges, experts, uh, 20 drawings by college students. Have them rate them on creativity on a scale of 1 to 7. And if they agree the product is creative, it is more, you know, or more creative than the others. 
It is created. You see how simple that is? In other words, the reliability is the validity, in a way. It's quite elegant, and I just like simple. I'm a more is less kind of person. And she's done this over and over and over. That it's, it's not like she just came up with this elegant idea and threw it out there and said, this is what it is. Her book, um, hmm, I think it was 1997, A Social Psychology of Creativity. It really is a social uh, view of creativity. Uh, it was the first that came out, and she's still writing, and still writing, and she works uh, a lot with business people, and she's written for the Harvard Business Journal. And the way she's tested this theory, as I said, she has had experts, she gives uh, products to a, a group of experts, they rate it, they're highly reliable, reliable, and some products float to the top. It's not, it's, and I have to say this, it's, it's not some, some way I would recommend that teachers rate their students. Don't get me wrong, this is kind of the, the, the research testing experiment literature. Keep that separate. We'll talk about how teachers might assess their students. Not this way. I, I don't, I would, I would not think. Make sense? Oh, sorry, Mike. Yeah. Question for the floor. Please. So, so has a, the same musical product been judged by both the Webster and the Emma View? Ha <laughs> I love the way you think. And Keep going. How do they differ in their judgment? How do these systems differ in their judgment of the same product? See, that's a beautiful idea for a research project, isn't it? Give students, uh, take students, um, a room full of students, give them the MCTM, and then take their compositions, and in another room, give them to a panel of judges, and do they correlate? Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah. We haven't done that a lot, but I did that once. I did that myself once for a presentation. I'll never remember where. Um, but I, I, did it, I did it once, and I need to repeat it. I need to do it again. But it, the correlation was virtually zero. Virtually zero. But it's interesting, Mod, you yes. go back to the question of expertise. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, it, it just reminds me of Foucault's four prohibitions of language and the way in which composition is identified or validated through expertise almost turns the whole crafting of composition as if it were a language. Mm. Grammar, mm -hmm. syntax, no blasphemous words, no play on the language, which is the very beginning, if you like, of creative endeavor. And it also makes me think <clears throat> that when you have experts determine uh, what these things are, I'm just reminded of Pharrell Williams' Happy. Um, and, you know, the convention, the, the conventional wisdom when Pharrell Williams' Happy came out was only Stevie Wonder can do naff stuff like that and get a top 10 or a top, top American um, hit. And he proved everyone wrong by playing on the very same conventions that you know, people said, "Oh, you only have to you have to have a, a McCartney or Stevie Wonder sort of frame of reference to be validated in that sense." So, yeah. well, when you bring up Pharrell Williams, I also think about all the popular stars now, like Star Search and America's Got Talent, and it's essentially a consensual assessment technique by experts. Where I thought, what I thought you were going to ask me is, who are the experts when we're dealing with little children, right? So that's another question, and I'm going to talk about that. But um, we really, uh, I, I've, my research area has moved a little bit, and uh, the more I talk about this this last week, the more I want to come back to doing. We need to, to test MCTM against CAT, MCTM against CAT. I would love to have that replicated. Researchers in the room, see how they align. That's a really great question. But I found, doing it once, that there was zero correlation. So that's it's an interesting problem, right? So in music, I tested Amabili's technique. This is, you know, I did the MCTM versus Amabili later, but I was very curious about it. I read this book, The Social Psychology of Creativity, and thought, ah, oh, this makes so much sense. But who are the experts? So when we're dealing with a second grader's composition, 
are university composers the experts? Are they the ones? The teachers the experts? Who should be the panel? And will this work with music? And so I um, had children compose in a relatively open manner, and I used um, GarageBand. I had them use computers, I think. I've done this several times. And you're going to hear some compositions where I had the children use com computers. But so I had the children compose a, a, a music, a, a piece of music with relatively open parameters. And then I take the compositions and randomize them and you give them to a panel of judges. And I gave them to very different panels of judges, wondering about how the reliability would work depending on how the judges were. Some of the instructions when you do the CAT, the consensual assessment technique, the judges have to know the, the age of the children. They have to know what the task is. They need a little background so they can judge. They're told to judge what they hear, or the mobly is what they see, um, relative to the other products. Not relative, so if they're listening to, when I say you're a judge, and I say this is a second grader's composition, judge it compared to the others. Don't judge it compared to Mozart. Okay? So knowing the context, this is a very, very important. And then write it on a scale of one to seven. I, 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 ba I think the, the exact wording is based on your subjective understanding of creativity, rate this product. I say nothing else. I don't say if it's fluent or flexible or blah, blah, blah. I shouldn't say blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay? So you understand how it's set up for the judges. I gave it to university composers, university music theorists. Five is all music teachers, meaning a combination of teachers who taught both instrumental music and um, general music and choral music. I gave it to all of them. And then I broke it out by whether they were band teachers. That's what I mean by instrumental. Mixed meaning they taught general music and instrumental. And then general choral teachers. The children were seventh grade children and second grade children. I also asked them to rate the compositions. And I'm going to highlight. <coughs> the agreeability amongst the judges. So the, the university composers closer to zero means no agreement. Not good. They are clearly, well if you go with, if you believe in the consensual assessment technique, they're not the experts. Theorists Interestingly, and this surprised me, that university theorists had high reliability with music teachers. And amongst the music teachers, the reliability was incredibly high. Incredibly high. So they were able to, they agreed with each other. They agreed with each other what they felt were the most creative compositions. And then the second grade children and the seventh grade children, uh, there was a high reliability on the compositions, but not with the teachers. So if you look at the bottom uh, panel, and this, <clears throat> these are the children um, with the teachers. Not so high. So in other words, the teachers were rating some comp the, the higher compositions different than the children, but yeah. So this needs to be pursued more, for sure. So when we ask who are the experts, <coughs> right, the teachers themselves. And this was important to me not as a way to teach teachers, and I teach teachers, to rate their students. It was important to me teaching teachers who are afraid of composing and improvising in the States. They're afraid of composing and improvising with their students because they don't do it themselves. So they think they are not experts and they're afraid they won't know how to give responses and they're afraid. And this to me says, you are the experts. You're working, you're, you're living in this classroom every day with second grade children have them compose and improvise, you're going to know. And to me, that's, that's what I get from this research. Not to say, ah, if you want to give them an A, set up a panel and judge them. That's not how I would use it. But 
it gives me uh, use to make teachers understand that you are the experts. Even though in the United States, when your teacher goes to college for becoming a music teacher, they do not get composition lessons. They do not get improvisation lessons at all. And that's why they are afraid to have children compose and improvise. <coughs> they really are. <coughs> So this kind of uh, wraps it all up again, just the, the background literature of creative thinking in music and how there really uh, are these two kind of strands going of the, the testing, in the testing world. I'm not talking about how teachers respond, but the testing world. Questions, confusions, comments, thoughts before we move on. As teachers, by the way, uh, I, I'll say it in this next slide. So, my friend Teresa Mobley, she's not really my friend, I've never met her, but I really like her, what she writes. <laughs> um, so, I think I call her. Um, has this really lovely, she kind of puts everything together. She calls this the confidential model of creativity, where the creative person in, in the middle, it takes a combination of their processes, their thinking processes, their intrinsic motivation, very important for creative thinking. Their domain skills. In order to compose something, you have to have your musical skills in order, and that's where teachers really come in. And then everything has to sit in a place, in an environment that's conducive to creativity. We have control over the place. We have control. We can really, we have expertise in helping students create, get their domain skills. The trickier bits, I mean, we can encourage creative processes. The, probably the trickiest bit is how to get kids intrinsically motivated. Um, that's the trickiest bit because it's very complicated, intrinsic motivation. So this is from a 2012 article she wrote, it's weird, and I, I literally took some of the quotes because it's, it explains these components really well. So for processes, it includes a cognitive style, personality characteristics that are conducive to, you saw the words I put up there before, independence, risk taking, taking new perspectives, disciplined work style, generating ideas. This makes sense. These are words that you threw out to me at the very beginning. That she sees this as a cognitive style. And um, we don't always see that. Like I said, there may be a very, very quiet young child in your classroom who's got this going on, but they're very quiet. And so that's why this is, a, this is also a tricky bit. Hard to control, hard to see. Easy. This makes sense. They said she's worked with business, product design, engineering. We get that. We do that well in music. People are most creative when they feel motivated primarily by the interest, enjoyment, satisfaction, and challenge of the work itself, not by extrinsic motivators. As research has shown, Extrinsic motivators can undermine intrinsic motivation. Their presence or absence in the social environment is critically important. So too is the presence or absence of forces that can support intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation can squelch creative creativity. So here we have this real issue for the classrooms and teachers who have to grade children. And that's very generalized. Again, you might have a child who thrives on extrinsic motivation and is most creative when they get their gold stars. But as a general rule, uh, extrinsic motivation squelches creativity. The problem is, at least in the United States, children enter school 
and the older and longer they're in school, the more they're driven by the external. They, they're going for that A, they're going for that high test score, they're, you know, they, we shape them into wanting the carrot. And I would say we squelch, I think sometimes we squelch the coaches <coughs> right out of them. What's the right answer? How many pages for that paper, Dr. Hickey? How many pages do I have to write? So write till you're done. How many pages to get an A, right? So we shape that. Uh, that's a whole other philosophical discussion. But. And then this is really, really important, the work environment. A positive challenge in the work, teams that are collaborative, diversely skilled, idea focused, freedom in carrying out the work. Supervisors, she's talking to business people or teachers, who encourage the development of new ideas. Top management, your building principle that supports innovation through a clearly articulated creativity, encouraging vision, recognition for creative work, mechanisms for developing new ideas, and norms of sharing their ideas across the organization. In the United States, you got to have a concert. You start school in September, and you better have a concert by December. Better. The principal says so, and the parents say so, and the administrators say so, so you see that's, uh, and I understand that's not so much here. Quite. <laughs> we should no? ask leaders in schools, shouldn't we? What's that? What? We should ask leaders in schools whether that's the same driver. <clears throat> or teachers in the system. Yeah. For whom concerts must happen at the end of term. You know, maybe for band, band and, and orchestra, probably. But I'm talking about second or fifth grade children. I'm talking about 10, 11, 12 year olds in those music classrooms. They have to have a Christmas concert where the children are standing on this and singing beautifully or they're playing their recorders. The pressure to get that and to sound good is, is huge. Huge. And I think it's artificial. I think we've we just built this into our system and we can blow it up. So is it? Do you have the same thing with 10-year-olds? Yes. I see some, yeah? Showcase. Showcase? Yeah. yeah. And the other thing I learned uh, talking to some teachers here is that, indeed, you have to give them a grade after 10 weeks. 10-year-olds? 8-year-olds? Yeah. And so there has to be some kind of product. So you see there's this tension between the kind of environment that is conducive to creative thinking and the structure of school. <coughs> yeah. I say, for your first showcase, make, make it completely original music by the children. Wow. There's, there's a compromise. Let the children create the music. The teachers say, oh no, they can't do that. Yes, they can. Uh, informal learning. You've learned about informal learning? That screams of informal learning, I think. Opening up the classroom, messing around, coming up with something, but on your own terms, at your own pace. I think it's really conducive to you. And then here is this idea. That's the other issue is, you know, a very limited view of improvisation as a type of creativity, um, you know, a right way to improvise, if you will. Yeah, and it's just this tension of the right way versus allowing uh, creative, open-minded thinking. So can we teach creativity? We certainly can encourage it. And I also believe the last bullet that we can, and we should have a mixture of, you know, right answer kind of uh, task for children as well as open-ended. We need to mix it up. And uh, despite the generalizations and what research says, the, the quiet little child who, who sits in the corner and doesn't say a word and, and, and thrives on extrinsic motivators might be one of the most creative children in your classroom. You know, we have to, that's why I say mixing things up is really, really important. In the United States, we tend to be too much on one side where we have to get to the right answer, get to the, get to the 
the concert, there's not enough time, give the grade, and so we, we tend to forget about giving children time to play and be messy and mix things up. Just because we, we compose and improvise in our classrooms also doesn't mean we're being creative. We can give really non-creative kinds of composition and improvisation exercises. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that should drive our assessment. So I, I was in the testing phase, and we talk about how teachers give feedback and how, uh, depending upon the task we give children, how to assess. And you know, if the composition, or let's say we give a composition assignment of, okay, today we're going to compose, and your assignment is to, you get to compose for two measures, make sure it's in 4-4 four, four time, in the key of B-flat, start on B-flat, end on B-flat, uh, did I say four measures, only use half notes and quarter notes, and, you know, don't use any um, accidentals. So there's a composition assignment. Lots of parameters because and because I want it to sound good. I want it to sound good. So uh, we have to be careful that composition. Just because we have children compose and improvise, which is great, and children should. It's one of the musical things we do. Doesn't mean we're necessarily <coughs> encouraging creativity. Make sense. your thoughts at this point? <coughs> Maud, in one of your <coughs> most recent publications, it seems that you interviewed um, a free improvisation, um, yeah. <coughs> well, someone in that list caught my attention because I've had a lot of time for her, Pauline Oliveros. Alina Alvarez, yes. Who, uh, who focuses a lot on deep listening. Yes. And sometimes what happens is in the improvising, improvising process, one assumes that the human doing oh. takes over the human being. And, you know, sometimes we forget. I mean, it, Blacking talks about that as well. The ability to listen invites and encourages other forms of creativity. Yeah. So the doing sometimes becomes so focused and so burrowed that the ability to reflect and reflects. Yes. Um, that was just a very recent article. I, I was curious about free improvisation. And so I studied for uh, what I would call expert free improvise pedagogues. They have free improvisation ensembles at their universities. So I just spent time watching them and, getting, and interviewing them and getting a sense of, well, how do you lead a free improvisation ensemble? That actually seems like an oxymoron, leading free improvisation. <laughs> and so I, I watched Pauline Alveros. She's one of my mm, most amazing heroes of the world. Her and Teresa Mobley. <laughs> uh, Ed Sarath, who's at the University yes. of Michigan and has a very active free improvisation ensemble. Uh, Fred Frith, who's at Mills College, a long history of free improvisation. And then a younger um, teacher, Dave Ballou, at Baltimore, who runs a, a free improvisation ensemble. And one of my major findings from that is listening is essential. Listening is essential and that we tend to kind of going for the product in schools we tend to forget about listening and giving children time to just listen. Uh, the other thing that was that I noticed that was essential is they did not very rarely did they say, say, say the group just performed or just jammed in free improvisation. They never talked about the, how good or bad it was, ever, ever. It was like, what did you just notice? What just happened? It's fascinating. So, a lot to learn from, I think, the free improvisers because they are on the, 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 the end of the continuum to that two-measure assignment I just explained. But listening was key. Listening was very, very important. Yeah, there's so much doing. Getting ready for the concert.
Can you avoid it, though? I think so. I think we have to change the mindset of our principals. Uh, I'm just thinking, you know, when, when students jam together, they oh. get around and they get to do things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the Arctic Monkeys who became famous on, on the internet, for example. Jam, and then suddenly they, they, they come to it. And of course, we've got a believer who's out there right now, too. But um, can we actually avoid that Levithian, that concert, that jam, that gig, that somehow makes people who they are? Well, right. I mean, that's what we do as musicians. Well, we com musicians compose, musicians also perform. We can we can lessen that need in, in school music, you know, and, and be have a balance, I think. I find here that wait time should be much longer than in the United States. Because you were so much more polite. <laughs> I'm sorry, they've got another class to go to. Okay, okay, well good. The timing was perfect because I had to have you stand up and just stretch for a little bit. And then we're going to listen okay. to some compositions. So. Yeah, let's take a stretch. Just stretch, do this, do some jumping jacks. I don't need to do tests. But I do, you will need paper and pencil because we're going to listen to some children's compositions. So any kind of paper, any kind of pencil, any kind of pen, crayon, computer, a virtual paper and pencil. Right? And before I move on to the next, uh, this kind of listing to children's compositions, I, I want to, I sh probably should have done this at the beginning, just to make sure everybody's clear when I throw out this translate. Mm -hmm. So now we're moving from the research world into the practical classroom world, teacher assessment, etc. And so when I use the term assessment, and this this is me, you may find Wikipedia says something different. Uh, I, I mean, giving feedback, assessing the situation, and providing feedback to a child. If I use the term evaluation, uh, I mean give judgment. So a child composes, I might give, I might assess the situation, talk about uh, this is a gray bag, and I see there are two zippers, so I'm assessing this bag. But if I give feedback, I don't like that bag. I don't like the color gray. So, right, so when I use the term evaluation, I mean putting a value on it, a grade, that grade gets a B. And these I use just right, to talk about improvisation or composition. A gray line between them. So a composition may have many components that are improvised. In fact, many uh, contemporary compositions have many moments that are improvised. But the composer intended it as a composition to be replicated. Improvisation, music made in the moment without too much concern about uh, replication. I'm going to go with this. <coughs> and as I said, <coughs> composition and improvisation do not necessarily mean creativity. Alright, I'm going to switch slides. Any questions about these? Not right or wrong, that's just when I use the term, that's what I'm, where I'm coming from. <coughs> That's in Wisconsin, on a lake, which is frozen right now. You can ice skate on it. <laughs> so I'm going to play six compositions for you. And um, these are, mm, let's see. I'm trying to think of the age as opposed to the grade. Um, 12 year olds? Okay. And uh, working in a computer lab using GarageBand. Do you, are you familiar with GarageBand? So it's a 
kind of a composition program where children can select sounds, put them together. Uh, they could either use the loops, so GarageBand has pre-made loops where you could drag loops into tracks, or you can play on a, they had a, a MIDI keyboard, so they could also pick a timbre and play a sound. And um, in this particular class, the children had an option uh, to compose based on some paintings we had, some Escher, we had some Escher um, sketches, and then this poem. So here's an example of six children who chose this poem as their inspiration. And you're going to hear the composition. So take uh, 30 seconds to read that poem. Oh, that's hard if you're in the back. Who would like to read it out loud? Can you see it from the back? So, actually, a little detour. One of another one of my <coughs> favorite writers is a, a man named Alfie Cohn, who's a psychologist who writes a lot about assessor uh, rewards and the, and the, 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 uh, uh, the danger of rewards. And one of the things he says that develops intrinsic motivation or encourages intrinsic motivation in the classroom is to give children choice, to allow them to collaborate, and to make the content authentic and real. And that makes a lot of sense. So I, whenever, whenever I'm working with kids, I give them choices. I'd love to give them choices. And so here's is an example. They can choose a painting, a sketch. Or All right. So we're going to play through. And um, the first time we play through, I want you to rate them on a scale of 1 to 7, using your own subjective definition of creativity. <coughs> give them a rating. Rate them compared to each other. Not Mozart. Um, try to use the scale. <coughs> what I'll do is I'll play the first three. They're short. So you get a kind of a sense, and then I'll go back and play all six. And after each one, just give it a number. Don't copy your neighbor. This is a test. Yeah. So just for fun. And then also as you're listening, kind of write notes so you recall what you heard, because we're going to talk about what we heard. Okay? All set? I'm going to play three. And then you go back and play all six. Number one. Hello. <laughs> 
of the spread, I'm going to go back to number one. And now we'll go through all six, write some notes, give each one a rating from one to seven, using your own subjective thoughts about creativity, based on the other one's 12-year-old children. Here we go. Number one.
Same lowest one. Just curious. That's an even an easier way to look at numbers. the hands, okay? Uh, we don't have time to calculate this, but um, yeah, raise your hand if you gave a five or higher for number one. Look around the room. Hands nice and high. Uh, number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. Number six. Number seven. <laughs> Wait! You can kind of see the trend, but you get the idea that, that that's how the, the assessment process works. But then you know what? 
in a sense, that sense of objective criteria has also been skewed by the fact that we've listened to number one more than once. Uh, Had we listened to number possibly. four more than once, yeah. maybe. Yeah, you start to, and, yes. And, and, yeah. And with, um, you might do this with 30 compositions just to kind of spread it out and listen to six twice, you know, just to get a sense, yeah. Now, put on your teacher cap. That was your kind of quasi-researcher cap. And I'm going to have you... Um, Uh, teacher cap. So, um, write down these questions. I'm going to go back and I want to play them again and I want you to think about how you would work with a student. The most important bullets are what question? Number one, what would you ask the student? If they said, here, this is my composition. What comments would you give the students? Those are the most important things. Kind of tuck away in your mind what you liked or didn't like about it. That you, not, you would not necessarily talk with the student about. But what would you ask them? What would be the first thing you would ask? And there were comments. And then if you were to make suggestions, what would you make? Okay, so you're going to think about those for each of the compositions. And then you're going to, I'm going to ask you to discuss again amongst yourselves. How would you respond as a teacher?
composition assignment was compose a two measure piece in two four time, B flat, begin on B flat, end on B flat, blah, 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 blah. These children would fail miserably. But it was a very open and, and a very open assignment. So the first thing you want to do is ask a question, not assume anything. So brainstorm. Uh, talk, talk to your partner and talk about each of these. What question would you ask the child? And talk about the compositions. Ready, set, go. After we have a little discussion about these, I'm just going to conclude this uh, presentation with ways of responding to children's compositions and improvisations that are relatively open, that won't squelch <coughs> their souls, their creativity. Uh, number one, somebody give me an example of a question you might ask the composer for the first composition. We, were, we thought that we would ask the people what they intended to convey with it because we don't have context, so we want to know for each. <coughs> well, the context is their poem, so talk a little bit more. I'm, I, so, so maybe the first one was a bit. Um, there was not much layering on going on, so maybe the first one thought <coughs> maybe lonely walking alone or. I see. Way, yeah. I see. So talk asking the student, you know, how how does this fit with the poem? Is it a story, <coughs> or is it? Or is it just? Yeah. What did you wish to convey? Mm -hmm. Because you might be really surprised, <laughs> really surprised, or you may hear a composition that you think is just a mess, and the child's response, you go, oh my goodness, that's brilliant. That's why with open, this kind of thing, you want to ask a question. Great. Anybody have another question for number one? I might ask, when the flute came out, you know, what, what, you know why did you have the flute come out here? Does it represent anything? Going along with this idea of what were you trying to... So having this conversation. You might even ask the children to, to write what they meant for practical purposes. You have 40 children in the class and maybe they have a, a log where they explain their composition. Number two. I can't even... Help me remember which one that was. That was the one with the motif. D-E and a descending of the process. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. What would you ask? Give me an example, another group. A question you would ask the, the composer. I mean, for each one, we could say, what did you intend? But can we have anybody come up with a specific to what you heard question? <coughs> what in the heck were you thinking? <laughs> That's not what you mean. I think the strong point there would have been the DE motive. So it sort of set a, a, a that out. riff. And, and, and right. find out if it was purposeful. Right. You know, maybe no, even then you had two things. You had a descending line, you had an ascending sort right. of punctuation. But the question would have been, how long do you think that might have lasted for? Uh, where do you think you might have taken it to? Right. Right. And, right. and even find out if the student was aware they were doing that mm -hmm. motive. I hear you have a motive here, this, this DE. Mm. Yeah. Number three. Anybody have a particular question you might ask about that piece of music? Were all your questions, what is the intent? Come on. OK. 
Okay, does the, does the student have an image in their head when composing? And so what is it? Right. And how did they use the music to portray it? Keep bringing, bringing it to the sounds, trying to understand why a student makes choices with sounds. Number four. That one I remember because of the rain stick. <laughs> and then, this, and then the, the, the sky seemed to clear. I mean, for me, I have no idea. I have no idea if that's what the child meant. I don't even want to say that's what I heard before I hear from the child. I had a very strong impression of a very uh, well-considered trajectory because the, yeah. the, the key, the key yeah. was between the D centricity and the F sharp centricity. It's played along a little bit so when it clears then you hear what sounds like all of the black notes on, yeah. with, with the yeah. F sharp centricity. Yeah. And I like the way in which it was weaved together and was deeply <coughs> considered. There was just, a, just that sort of, uh, what's the word for it? There, there was just that right time. Right. The right sense of time yeah, yeah, that yeah. gives you an idea that, okay, I, I can be interested in this. Yeah. I can be interested in it, this. It, it re uh, resonated with me in the yes. same way. But I'm going to ask first, why did you choose the rain stick to start? And did the child mean for that to be the storm? You know, ask first and then go and, and say. Number five, we heard a voice, did we? I might ask the, the composer, I couldn't hear what you were saying. What were you saying? <laughs> you know, and then help the child work with balance in GarageBand. You know, help them technically. That's an easy one to respond to. Without giving plus or minus, it's just like, I couldn't hear. So first of all, tell me what you were saying. Unless that's what we intended. True, yeah. true. Right. And the, yeah, did you, did you mean for this to be mysterious and I couldn't understand? But the child says, no, I wanted you to hear this. Then we help them. We, that's easy to respond. We show them how to fix the balance. Thing. Number six. Question, could you ask? That, yeah. Oh, I thought your hand was up. <laughs> that, that, that's a real, that one for me is a real, tell me about your composition. What, 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 what were you intending? You know? We had a friend that noticed that this was... He was repeating Ode to Joy. Oh, I heard Ode to Joy, that's right, in that one. Yeah. <laughs> or, or trying, getting really close to Ode yeah. to, to Joy. I heard that too. Is it because this child takes piano lessons and they just learned this song and did they mean it? Do they even know they're playing Ode to Joy? In or this? are they having difficulty coping with the psychomotor activity? Could very well be, right. And trying to figure out how to make it fit in there. And, yeah. and if they did use Ode to Joy, ask them why. Does it relate to the poem? <coughs> So that is how we want to respond to children's compositions. Ask, especially if the parameters are open. Well, are you comfortable with the word improvement in your last Yeah, program? I am too. And I'm going to show you a list of suggestions uh, from uh, Sam Reese, the researcher, who talks about how to work with children if, if you feel like you want to make help them make changes. Being very careful about that. I, I'm totally with that. His beauty is certainly in the eye of the beholder. someone's composition or improvisation is better than others. And so learning to give a feedback it, it, is very important, but it, you have to be very sensitive. Lowen felt great to come from the visual art literature. Rena Euphidus wrote a book called Can I Play You My Song, which is fascinating about the notation, the, the writing notation of children's composition, the development of notation.
Yes, 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 yes. These are all legitimate reasons for asking children to compose or improvise. But the answer should determine the kind of assessment you do. That's the key. This process uh, is Understanding by Design from Wiggins and McTai. So for assessment, uh, this is a very common assessment process that we use in the United States. Now, now I'm in teacher hat. I'm not in researcher hat. I'm in teacher hat. So what do you want the students to know? Teach it to them. Give them a task for them to show their knowledge and then figure out how to measure it. Backwards by design. Start with the end in mind. Teach it, work backwards, and then find out if they learn. UBD. I notice you like acronyms a lot here. <laughs> Understanding by design is UBD. You know what I mean by LO5? It comes from your GMP. I'm trying to learn lingo here. <laughs> so let's say you're driven by your general music program syllabus, <coughs> learning objective five, and you have a, a building supervisor who really wants you to follow these standards, if you will. And so this might be a very legitimate goal in your uh, level one classroom, P1. Very legitimate. You teach them. You teach for five weeks and you learn about pentatonic uh, melodies and rhythmic responses and you get children to call and respond and, and play back with you, etc. Very different. Yeah. Yeah. Also legitimate. And again, it begs the question of which stage of them you're at. Uh, Let's pretend this is both stage four. I like to pretend. Actually, the first one is pretty babyish for stage four, probably. But the second one could be stage two. You could have a goal that by the end of stage two, your children, your students will be able to organize sounds in imaginative and expressive ways. This might be a task at assessment time for the first goal. Relates to what you were hoping the students could do. It's just the rhythmic. It has to do with the compound meter. It doesn't have to do with the pentatonic, but I could create another task to test their knowledge of the pentatonic melody. Or this could be the task for the other goal. I want them to think imaginatively. I want them to express. I want it to be original, so I'm going to tell them, make it sound like nothing you've ever heard before. So I'm encouraging, I'm giving them permission to create something different. The first one, I'm not giving them much permission. And then uh, I might create rubrics to judge them, to assess them. That's step three. Here's a rubric that I might use for that first task. And I took the components on the left hand side right from the task. And here's a rubric I might use if I were to use a rubric for a step of the other one.
there are some things that are clear. I asked the student to use three instruments. That's easy. They did it. Uh, uh, one of my, in a rubric, if you write a rubric, you're showing your values as a teacher, what you hope the children will do. So to me, for this particular class, I want them also to perform well. So I'm going to throw that in the rubric. I ask them to write a description. And then creativity. I'm going to throw creativity in the rubric. I know that's a very much uh, in contrast to what I've been saying the whole time. You know, you throw creativity in rubric is nice to squelch creativity. But here, if my teacher hat, I want children to think about making novel and interesting compositions, so I might throw that in the rubric. So they, again, have permission. So your path for using composition and improvisation are to assess musical skills. And by the way, composition and improvisation are great ways, great ways to assess musical skills. It's, it's so easy to evaluate. Evaluate. It's so easy. They did it or they didn't. They, they show you those skills or they did not. Path two is different though. discussion with the student. And Lerman's critical response process is a, Ms. Lerman is a dance teacher and she wrote this critical response process that creates these steps towards dialogues about original things. And it's great for children also to learn how to dialogue with each other about what they hear their peers creating and creating a safe environment that's conducive to creative thinking and not crushing souls. Run through that pretty quickly. Oh, and then this is what I was referring to. Ask questions, provide feedback. This comes from an article by Sam Rees, who observed the way art, visual artists give feedback to each other or to you know, experts give feedback to students. I can't stress this enough, and we kind of did that exercise. What was your intent? Delay judgment. Delay judgment. Here's this improvement bit. So if you think that the student could have just changed the timbre, you know, it's okay. Have that conversation. Try it. Make sure the student understands they have permission to ignore your suggestion. Incremental changes. This is the mix it up culture. Don't assess everything. Let children compose and play and tuck things away and give you their best work at the end. Let them choose which one you evaluate if you have to give a grade. And don't don't evaluate everything. I understand that's hard to do because you see students once a week and you gotta give them a grade. Be a facilitator. Here's the critical response process uh, that I was talking about. It's, when you start with it, it's a bit clunky, but it, I think would be, if, if students got used to it, it'd be a really useful way to create dialogue in a classroom about creative products. And I'm just gonna fly through this. When we start by naming the fact that the work has meaning at all, and we offer options for responding to broaden uh, that meaning, we broaden the lens by which responders can experience a comment. New phrasing encourages responders to be more specific, enabling them to name their experience, affords artists a different way of accepting information. The whole dialogue becomes less about the individual psychology and more about the power of art. It's a premise for an process. The teacher is the facilitator, the responders are the other students in the classroom. So not saying, what did you like about this? Okay. Yeah. What did you like about it? What did you not? But asking the, the, the so you just play a student's composition. What struck you about the work? 
Next, after that discussion, the artist, the composer, should ask the listeners questions. Well, what did you think about when I brought the flute in? Did you think it was too soon? Giving the actual composer time to find out what their audience thought about. And the facilitator can help them out that. The listeners ask questions. Why did you use your voice? They have to be neutral questions. Why did you use your voice? It could be like, why did you use your voice? It's like, it was stupid. It's interesting you used your voice. What were you trying to say, right? And then finally, uh, the facilitator invites opinions. Now, now we've had a discussion about the piece, and we have opinions. Put very simply, and then the facilitator closes the dialogue. Put very simply, uh, this could also be written. So as children listen to each other's compositions, they write their questions. Or the artist, the composer, uh, writes the questions that they would like the children to respond to. So time-wise, there could be a listening rubric. You collect it as a teacher, you synthesize it, and then maybe the, another class, you get, the, you, you get it going quicker than that. As I said, it can feel bulky, but once it goes, it's a great way to set up a safe dialogue. And that's important. And then this little bit later, wraps it up. picture on Saturday. It was in Kampong Glam. It was perfect. I will treasure this picture because I know walking through Singapore and taking many pictures, but it really wraps up my thinking about creativity. With that, I'll finish, but I'll also take any questions you might have. Thank you, Maul. I hope this was helpful. Researcher hats and teacher hats. But I also wondered if you raised the question in a way uh, about the fact that our visual art uh, uh -huh. colleagues are a little more fortunate because um, in some cases, they're not drawing apples, they begin by being creative. Whereas in the culture that we've been brought up with, you know, you've got to do a Beethoven cover, you've got to do a Mozart cover, and you end up your entire life doing nothing but covers, and then worrying how to be creative. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think the mindset is, as teachers, we don't, we're not teaching music in order to get our students into the, the, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. We're teaching our students music in order to enjoy music for life and be joyful and come to class and be creative, etc., etc. But that mindset of, especially in the United States, you know, performance. Yep. Any other questions? You can talk to me once you stand up. I don't know what your teacher is going to make you do right now. First day back, give you a test. Right? You don't strike me as the test type of teacher. Well, thank you for being a wonderful audience and uh, playing with my ideas.